Now, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Community Matters. We're joined this afternoon by Sandy Ma, Executive Director of Common Cause Hawaii, uh, who I admire greatly. Did you hear that, Sandy? Did you hear what I said? I admire you greatly. <laughs> Jay, you're way too kind. Thank you for having us <laughs> Hawaii. We're talking about voting bills today, okay? Uh, so the larger issue is that voting has become more important, you know, more higher on our priority list, our consciousness, if you will. We associate voting um, appropriately with the democracy because that's how democracies work. You know, you vote for the people who lead you, who have the power. And so uh, voting on the mainland is, is kind of a train wreck. May I say that? Train wreck. Uh, we don't have the voting bills that, are, that, that Joe Biden wanted to pass. We don't have either one of them. And we have several uh, legislatures, I mean like a dozen, uh, on the mainland who are pulling the rug out from under voting. So I want to talk about both ends of that. First end is Hawaii, because Hawaii is a leader, actually, in fair, free and fair elections and voting. Uh, at the same time, you, you are tuning it up, polishing it off, and you have two bills going on in the ledge. I don't know if they're your bills or somebody else's bills. You should tell us where they came from. What bills are they, Sandy? So uh, thank you for that, Jay. So Common Cause is a national nonpartisan grassroots organization, and our mission is to ensure that uh, people um, are able to participate in government and that government is uh, representative of the people versus special interests. And that starts off with voting, as you said. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, our voting systems are secure and uh, open uh, and secure at the same time. And so we do have two bills that uh, are moving through the legislative process. The legislature ends this Thursday, May 5th. Uh, one of the bills is HB 1883, HB House Bill 1883. And that is a bill that was proposed by Common Cause Hawaii. And that is um, dealing with giving notice of voting of ballot translation services to the people. Um, uh, so um, that is a bill proposed by Common Cause Hawaii, and that has already been enrolled to the governor for his signature. And what that bill does is um, it has, uh, um, well, currently, let's start off currently and what the law is currently. So Section 203 of the National Voting Rights Act provides that um, Oahu. Um, has voting translation services in two languages for people on Oahu in Mandarin, Chinese, and in Filipino. And what is Filipino? It's like Tagalog or Ilocano. And so um, if you uh, need translation services, you could get it in Mandarin or in uh, Tagalog or Ilocano if you live on Oahu. And it also extends that uh, right um, to uh, the county of Maui, but it just extends it in Filipino, which is Tagalog or Ilocano, the two main languages. So if you live on Kauai or if you live on Hawaii County and you need language translation services, uh, it is not mandated by federal law. And so we saw that gap in the 2020 elections with vote by mail. And so we decided to remedy that uh, uh, with this law HB 1883, which will take effect, not unfortunately not for this 2022 elections, but for 2024 elections. So are there bills like this on the mainland? Are there translation services on the mainland in any state? So there are translation services mandated by federal law, like I said, uh, Section 203 of the National Voting Rights Act. But I don't know if there's a bill similar to what we've done here. So our bill is unique uh, in the sense that uh, language translation services, uh, notice of language translation services will be provided in Hawaiian, which is our state official language. And the five most uh, uh, necessary languages or most needed languages. And what we've seen in Hawaii is that we are the most um, diverse state uh, in the nation, according to our 2020, uh, excuse me, uh, our 2020 census. And actually, um, non-English speakers at home increased um, recently um, in the last two decades, um, and that uh, less than 40% of um, English proficiency um, is at home. Uh, English proficiency amongst uh, non-English speakers have been increasing at home. 
And so people actually need language um, translation services in Korean, Vietnamese, Chinese, and Ilocano speaking populations. And so that's why we have this notice of um, language translation services bill that's actually sitting before the governor to be signed. So why some languages and not others? Why not just d deal with all of them? Well, it's a uh, it's notice of language translation services. So because we have to retain uh, people uh, to be able to translate the language services, um, to, to be able to translate the ballots into different languages. So that could be um, a need that uh, uh, could be hard to fulfill if we do all languages because we don't know what the languages are. Mm -hmm. And so we did the six uh, languages in the bill. So what do you say to me if I speak uh, Tibetan? Uh, and uh, I, I can't read the ballot, but I, I do qualify to vote. Yeah, so um, that's something that, uh, um, you know, we will try to help uh, um, people get the language translation services. If there's enough time given in advance that you need this service, um, then uh, definitely we will try to help you uh, obtain language translation services. Mm -hmm. So step me through it. So I, uh, let's say I'm, Chinese, for example, um, and I speak Chinese, but not not so much English, uh, but I am qualified to vote and uh, I would like to uh, avail myself of, of the benefit of this bill. I mean, once it's signed and I, I believe it will be signed. Um, um, how do I do that? What's the process? So the process is that on the it's a notice. So I'm going to show this to you. And this is what we saw in 2020. Um, it was an envelope that came uh, sent to um, voters. I'm sorry, it's not showing up very well. It was an envelope uh, where the ballot, this is the 2020 uh, vote by mail ballot. And there was a notice of language translation services um, on the Oahu, I live on Oahu. And so on the um, back of the ballot uh, envelope, um, it's notice of language translation services. And it says, if you need language translation services, you call this number and they will give you language translation services. And so what we've done is have that service be extended to six languages, that notice be extended to six languages. So if you need language translation services in six languages, call this number uh, to get help. And so I'm hoping that will trigger uh, for uh, uh, all people who need, uh, who are voters, uh, who need language translation services, uh, it could be in Chamorro um, that you call this number and say, look, um, I need help. Uh, I need this ballot translated in a, uh, in a language that I can read and understand um, to, to do this for me, uh, to just, you know, even if it's not in this written um, language um, that I can read and understand, um, that it just triggers someone else to call and help get this language translation service for you. Okay, so the person who answers the phone <clears throat> when me, a Mandarin speaker, calls and asks for help, does that person speak Mandarin? So there is a service um, on the other end that will connect you with a speaker of your native language. Mm, okay, good, good. <laughs> who pays? Taxpayers. <laughs> it's through the Office <laughs> of Elections, yes. But the service was all, always there. It was just not publicized. And we were publicizing, uh, requiring the Office of Elections and the county's election divisions to publicize the service. OK, now I have to, now I have to ask you my flip side question. OK, ready? <laughs> OK, <clears throat> suppose I'm a taxpayer and I find out about this and I say, why should I pay for somebody um, to vote in, in another language? This is the this is America. And uh, if they want to vote, they should speak English. They don't speak English. They should learn English. There's no reason for the for the government to go and take these steps. What do you answer? You know, I hear that a lot, and I understand on that visceral reaction to that. Um, so my my response is, um, my parents are immigrants to this country, and they do speak English. Um, they don't read English very well, but they do speak English. Um, they are naturalized citizens, and um, they take um, the responsibility of voting incredibly seriously. Um, when I was young, they would take me to the polls with them. 
uh, to vote. And that's where I've, you know, grown up loving the uh, idea of voting and, and voting every single chance I got since I turned 18. Uh, given that they are immigrants and they love uh, America and the responsibility of voting, but they don't read English very well, they don't want to make a mistake. And so when I went to the polls with them, they would always ask me, am I reading this correctly? Am I filling this ballot out correctly? I don't want to vote wrong and have my vote be uh, counted incorrectly. Um, and that is why um, these ballot translations are so important for immigrants. It's not uh, that we are trying to get a service we don't deserve. It is so that we can make sure we are voting correctly and properly. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to the polls giving my parents um, a wrong uh, or, or, or uh, a wrong uh, improper lift up in the polls. I was just translating for them to make sure uh, that they were doing uh, filling out the polls correctly. It is like getting um, an accommodation when taking a test, uh, and that's that is really what immigrants uh, when you are giving them a translation service uh, for voting. They want to do it correctly. They don't want to fill out something wrong and have their vote be encountered as an overvote and, and their ballot be spoiled. Oh, yeah. So the, and now you've described a, a scenario where the, uh, uh, the translator person, what, goes into the ballot uh, box with them? I mean, into the poll itself uh, and helps them understand the ballot or what? Oh, no, that was when I was a kid and I just... No, no, that. now, now. Oh, no, they could, they could uh, just tr uh, give them a translated ballot, or they could just read the instructions to them. Okay, so yeah. they don't have to go inside the poll behind the curtain or anything like that? Oh, oh no, no. Uh, no, because uh, it's, it's a vote-by-mail ballot. It's just explaining the instructions. And, and honestly, I think that's a really good thing to have here in Hawaii, because our um, primary ballots, if you cross party lines, your ballot is uh, spoiled, you, it doesn't count. And so that's really um, important to explain to someone, don't cross party lines. You may like a candidate for this one race from this one party, and you may like a candidate from this other party for this other race, but if you cross party lines, your ballot will not count. Mm. And so that's very important to let somebody know. But I caught something else you said. So the, the uh, translator will translate, say, all the mm, Chinese ballots, okay? And that's good for anyone who speaks Mandarin. I mean, you're not going to translate it separately for every voter. You translate it for the whole group of voters. So it's not, not that expensive because you're just getting an, another version of the ballot uh, in the translated language, right? Yeah, it's translating instructions as well. And so that's really important, translating instructions. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the second bill. Um, that is expected to pass, by the way. That is, David Ige is expected to sign that bill, right? Uh, the Notice of Translation Services, I hope so. There was yeah. really uh, no um, opposition to that Notice of Translation Services. Like I said, the Office of Elections and the Elections Division supported it. So, okay. What about the second bill? Uh, we also um, were uh, supporting ranked choice voting. Um, and this is ranked choice voting for just special federal elections and special vacant county council seats. So it was just for very limited races um, to, to help people um, get to become familiar with ranked choice voting in Hawaii. So what's the problem that this bill would solve? So in ranked choice voting, um, it's, it's to help um, uh, to correct. Um, so ranked choice voting uh, it happens when there is like, uh, okay, <laughs> ranked choice voting, a lot of people have concerns with ranked choice voting in that um, there, there's confusion over the ballot process and how you rank the ballot. Um, but it's, it's really a very simple, um, procedure in which uh, if there are multiple candidates running for one office, then you a, a voter doesn't have to just select one person that um, has like the most name recognition or, or a, a select one candidate that a voter thinks the candidate will most likely win. 
a voter can just rank the candidates in order of preference. Um, and so this will allow the voters uh, choices to actually count. Um, and so, so we think that will create more engagement um, in Hawaii. Um, and so that's what we think right choice voting will solve the problem of just not saying, oh, my vote won't count because I like this candidate and this candidate won't win. Um, and so we're not gonna bother voting. And so that's why we hope ranked choice voting does get passed in Hawaii because it'll allow candidates to like rank their, the candidates in order of preference versus just only having to select one person the one person with the most name recognition or the one person who has like the biggest war chest and could spend the most money. Um, so that's why ranked choice voting is important in Hawaii. So uh, is uh, ranked choice voting, is it, it is being done in other states, as I recall. And I wonder uh, if you could describe it, how it operates and whether it's the same thing in the other states and also whether it's been successful there. Yeah. So. Ranked choice voting has been adopted in 55 jurisdictions um, nationwide, and about 10 million voters will be voting uh, by ranked choice uh, ballot in 2022 in this upcoming election. So it's been used um, by a lot of people in a lot of different places. Um, I don't know if uh, um, everyone recalls that in New York City, the New York City mayor was recently elected by ranked choice voting. Um, Alaska senators were elected by ranked choice voting. Um, Maine's uh, governor is elected by ranked choice voting. So there's a lot of large races elected by ranked choice voting. Like I said, in Hawaii, we are only uh, pushing for ranked choice voting in two narrow races by special federal election and by special vacant county council races. And, and these races, everybody, uh, Democrats, Republicans, Greens, everybody is all on one ballot and they are all running um, at the same time. And so uh, people are uh, free to rank these um, you know, candidates in their order of preference. And that's for special federal elections, for um, county council seats or county council uh, races. They're nonpartisan, and so a lot of people run in Bacon County Council races, county council seat. So um, why not do all the races this way? It, I mean, it, it creates a certain amount of, um, what do you want to call it, inconsistency. If I, ha if I go down and vote on one race and it's one system, and on the other race it's the ranked choice system, why not do them all that way? Yeah, so that's a great question. We decided to look at the special federal election and special vacant county council seats because like i said that's a um, winner take all all at once uh there's not a, a runoff after um um there's one uh after a special election uh, the um the person who wins the most votes gets the most votes is the uh, winner of that special federal election and for special vacant county council seats, again, if the person uh, gets the most votes, then the person is elected to that uh, open uh, special uh, election county council seat. And so we thought those two races would be a good way of uh, getting the voters uh, adjusted to the ranked choice ballot instead of having like a primary election where you have a ranked choice ballot and then going on to a general election with a ranked choice ballot who wanted just to have a discrete ballot and for people to get used to the ranked choice ballot and how the tabulation ranking works. So um, you don't have to have a runoff where you might otherwise have a runoff. You know, you're saving the taxpayers the money of a secondary election. That could be a lot of money, no? Yes, that's absolutely right. Um, but, I, but we didn't want to, um, all of a sudden we do <laughs> our <laughs> electoral system and doing away with the primary and general election, we wanted uh, people to understand the benefits of a ranked choice ballot. Um, um, you know, so, kind but, of, but do you contemplate that maybe another change later or a, a series of changes 
where you know you, you sort of work your way to rank choice on everything you can possibly use it for, right? Yes, hopefully, um, you know, people could see the benefits of it truly working and coming up with a good majority candidate with a ranked choice ballot instead of having, you know, a candidate that, you know, only, let's say, I don't know, 15, for example, 15% of the voters selected, you know, um, you know, so that's why we wanted to do kind of like a pilot ranked choice with these two races. Well, you know, presumably, you know, this is all about educating citizens and making them understand their powers and their rights and their duties and so forth as citizens. Um, and uh, I just wonder, I mean, I guess one of the implications here is that if I was faced and I knew I was faced with ranked choice voting, then I would probably study all the candidates uh, more because I, I have a duty as to each one. Um, rather than just pick the one that, you know, falls in the right ethnic name or uh, a name recognition of some other kind. And uh, this way, I, I, I'm motivated, I think. I don't know if this really works this way, but I'm guessing it, I would be motivated um, to study them all and make intelligent priorities. Is, is that the way it works? Well, um, there's also... Um, a burden on the candidates to reach out to a broader swath of the uh, electorate to try to appeal to a broader swath of the electorate instead of just narrowly appealing to um, their, you know, who they think they could uh, get to vote for them and to win by a narrow uh, margin. And so it kind of tones down the rhetoric and builds more consensus and, and goodwill across um, uh, across the voting group. And so that's what we found that was really helpful with ranked choice voting, that, you know, they talk more about policies instead of mudslinging. At oh, each yes, that's so important in our time, because I'm sure you've noticed, I, I have, is that we get less, uh, less platforms on public policy issues than we do, you know, ethnic or mudslinging or, you know, things that are really not important. Um, let, let me ask you one other thing about that, though. Suppose, suppose I didn't do my homework, just suppose, and I'm faced with a, a whole slate of candidates that I'm supposed to prioritize. And, you know, this happens on OHA all the time because nobody knows <laughs> who's running for OHA. They don't know them. Okay, so, so I have a, a whole list, and it's all on the ballot there, and I have to rank it, but I don't know them all. Uh, I don't know enough to rank them. So how, how does the ballot work when I'm supposed to rank them, but I don't know enough to rank them? Sure, that's a great question. You don't have to rank if you don't want to. You could just choose one, but you have to choose uh, number one. You can't like skip the number one and just go to three or skip three and go to five. You have to like choose one. Mm -hmm. uh, when you choose one and you can't like skip two and rank three, or you can't double up on one and go, everyone is one, 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 one across the board. That will um, invalidate your ballot. So you could only rank one. Uh, and then you could rank, if there's a slate of, let's say, 10, um, you could rank just one, two, three. You don't have to rank all 10. Um, so that's how ranked choice uh, ballots work. Uh, you should not skip numbering. Uh, you can't assign people the same numbers. Um, but you don't have to rank all all the numbers. You could just rank like one and one two or one two three. Um, however num many numbers you want to rank, but you do have to rank them in order. Um, you can't skip numbers. You can't assign the same numbers. Mm. So if um, if both bills pass, then the translator bill will have to translate those instructions into say the Tagalog. And um, and I will have to understand that, and it may be a little more complicated than my my expectation, right? So you have to get people who can translate all of that, and make sure that people understand the new system. We we have little schematics already um, that says you know here's a sample ballot where um, it shows you how to fill it out, and it shows a little X where if you rank the same number across the candidates, it's an X. If you skip numbering, that's an X. And so we have little um, sample ballots uh, already ready to go. Oh, good. <laughs> so what's the chance of that, uh, of that second bill uh, on the, on the uh, 
what do you call it, um, the, um, voting, um, the passing. Is there anybody who opposes? I mean, for example, if I'm a candidate or I'm supporting a candidate who is going to, you know, try to run on name recognition, <laughs> I don't like this bill. I want to I want to do it the old fashioned way on name recognition. So is there anybody out there that's opposing this bill? Yes. Yeah, so um, the Republicans um, elected in our state legislature have come out against ranked choice voting. Um, and so which is kind of disappointing because, um, you know, it's ranked choice voting has been adopted in red states like many jurisdictions in Utah use ranked choice voting. Our military uses ranked choice voting, um, and so it's it's very interesting. Um, but uh, they feel like it will disadvantage them here in Hawaii. But it's a ranked choice voting really is a nonpartisan um, uh, ballot. Well, not for not for the Republicans. I mean, if you if you draw a line between the Republicans here and assume they have some contact connection, some leadership from the Republicans, such as the Republicans are on the mainland. They're going to be opposing any kind of improvement voting system because look what they've done on the mainland. You know, it's kind of the platform is only to constrain voting, uh, but not on public policy. I, that's my comment. You don't have to agree with that or not. Uh, <laughs> we don't because it really is a nonpartisan issue. Like recently, Virginia's Republican Party adopted ranked choice voting. And so it's it really. Um, it's a nonpartisan uh, issue, Sandy, but the Republicans have all gotten together in Hawaii and opposed the bill. Yeah, I, I don't, that's absolutely partisan. No? Yeah, I, I don't really understand why. Um, so, <laughs> okay, let's let's um, that's a this is a perfect segue to getting to the national now. Common cause, uh, to its credit, uh, you know, a very important feature in our democracy cares a lot about voting. That's why we're here. That's why you introduced these two bills, uh, and I truly hope they both pass. Um, and the question is, um, you know, th this is a very small effort, okay, in Hawaii, as opposed to a much larger effort to ensure free and fair elections on the mainland. I know Common Cause heavily involved in that. We talked about that before, and you brought in one of your national officers to, to discuss it. I just want to know the situation, um, what it looks like. Uh, I can tell you that for one voter, I am very concerned uh, that in November or before November, as the case may be, um, these changes that, happen, that are happening in a dozen states, thanks to um, partisan Republican actions in state legislators, legislatures, and for that matter, the failure of the voting rights bills, two of them in Congress, will have a very negative effect on free and fair voting. So query, what can a common cause do? Um, what is Common Cause doing, and how does it look? So that is a really good question, and um, we are disappointed that the voting rights bills um, in Congress uh, did not pass. But we are uh, currently working on our election protection program to make sure that uh, people are able to access the polls and ballots are getting to the people. So we are actually um, engaging in robust election prote protection work as we speak right now. Um, early uh, voting is in progress in Georgia as we speak, and so uh, we are making sure that we are monitoring uh, the polls and reporting any type of intimidation, and we are um, working hard at it, and we have attorneys standing by. We are still doing redistricting and reapportionment work, and so um, to try to make sure that uh, um, our lines are fair and accurately represent the people that we are not having communities of interest, um, you know, minority communities split up for the next decade, uh, diminishing our uh, political power, our electoral vote. Um, so we are still uh, doing all that we can. Uh, the work never stops. The fight doesn't stop for us to represent the people, to make sure that people are properly represented. That's why I love Common Cause. They're at the core of our democracy. It's very important. Uh, what's your website? Uh, it's uh, commoncause.org uh, backslash Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dave. Well, I just have one other question I want to ask you, Sandy, and that is this. Um, it seems to me that, um, you know, the word has gotten out to all uh, communities in the country that there are those who would stop us 
from voting. There are those who would, um, you know, um, uh, take actions uh, that would make it more difficult for people to vote and, and, and clear that that is what the intention of that legislation in those various states on the mainland would do. And it's clear that the Republicans in general across the country have taken the position they, that they want to depress voting. Uh, and it often, if not always, it's a, it's a racial issue. Um, so the question is, and this is a hard one, but I bet you somebody in Common Cause has thought about this, is, is that going to get a reaction among the moderate voters to say, wait a minute, what is going on here? You know, our democracy is based on free and fair voting. These people are, are going the other way. They're trying to suppress free and fair voting. I am therefore going to vote against anything they come up with. Is there, do you think, does Common Cause think, if it thinks about this, going to be a negative reaction um, to those politicians, those legislators, those Congress people, you know, who are opposing voting rights? I hope everyone votes their conscience and everyone votes every election, not just the general election, um, but, you know, midterm elections, because Every vote does count, not just the national vote, but the state and local elections. Um, so I hope everyone votes um, every election, not just national, but state and local elections, because it all matters, as we can see. You expect a big turnout in November? Uh, nationally or, or locally? I hope well, I hope. <laughs> each one, either one, both. I, I, I really do. I really hope so, because, you know, it's... Um, I really do. There's so much is on the line. You know, it's not just voting rights. Um, it's, you know, it's climate change, e everything, you know, it all it all matters. You know, I, I think we say this every election, but it really, you know, it, every election matters. It really does. Let me take one more question, and that is, um, is there a trend here? And, and I, I don't mean a trend over 50 years. I mean a trend over like two or three years. Um, where people are more interested in what happens uh, in their respective jurisdictions, where they go down to vote because they want to exercise their franchise, because they want to have a say, uh, because they're concerned that, that uh, the people must speak. Is there a trend to more interest by more voters? I, you know, I, I really hope so. Um, I, I really hope people take more interest in their government. Um, I, I have heard, um, you know, from a few people that the recent uh, corruption allegations in the state have turned people off from voting, and I don't understand that sentiment. Like, why would corruption allegations cause you not to vote? I would want more oversight of my uh, elected officials. I would want more say in what they're doing instead of less say in what they're doing. Um, uh, but I, I don't understand people um, a lot of times. Uh, and so, um, you know, uh, but I, I hope people are not so jaded and cynical that they want nothing to do with government because that makes bad things even worse. So, you know, pe people need to be involved. I, I know we're all busy. We're all tired from the pandemic. We were, you know, very hard. Um, we have family obligations. But this is our government, um, and, and so we we cannot afford um, to not be involved. And so, whether it's just one phone call to your legislator or your council member to say, "I'm disappointed" or "I'm really happy with what you're doing," that is enough, you know. And so we we cannot afford not to be involved. Good for you. Good for Common Cause. Sandy Ma, Executive Director of Common Cause Hawaii, thank you so much for showing, uh, appearing on our show. Thank you, Jay, for having Common Cause Hawaii. Thank you for being an ally and friend. Absolutely. Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.